Welcome, everyone, and good afternoon. I am Sarah Rosen Wartell, and I have the great honor of being the president of the Urban Institute and getting to start off this terrific program today. Now, before I jump in, because uh, you probably haven't done enough Zoom events, let me do a quick review of the housekeeping. Uh, we are recording this event, and the recording and the relevant links will be posted online after the event if you want to refer someone to it or come back. We have turned on live captions, but you can each control that yourself, depending upon your preference. If you want to turn it off, click the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen. Um, we have made bios of the speakers available at the event page for today's event at urban.org. So that'll allow us to stream through introducing people. Check them out there. Um, all of the participants are muted um, and the chat is disabled, but you can type questions into the Q&A box at any time. And we'll be using those to kind of uh, develop the uh, questions for the panelists as the day goes on. We'll also be sharing a link to a post-event survey. And if you would just take one second to do that, we would be really grateful to you. Um, it's really helpful to us and the panelists to hear what you're thinking about, and it helps shape what we do in the future. And finally, if you love something you hear or you want to comment on it, you can join the conversation online on Twitter using the hashtag LiveAtUrban and TransformPrison. Uh, so please, um, hopefully uh, that'll help us to get the good word out about the great conversation we're about to have. So uh, a little bit about uh, the topic today. Um, and I probably don't need to tell those who have chosen to tune in that um, prisons in America are actually a sizable part of American society with 1.3 million people uh, um, uh, incarcerated and employ more than 200,000 in correction officers in state-run institutions. These institutions consume a great deal of our public resources. And yet um, the insight that drove us launching this initiative and what the research has confirmed is that despite this important investment um, and uh, infrastructure that has been built, these public institutions have some of the least transparent and most, and they are some of the most understudied, understudied uh, institutions in our country. So to better understand prison environments and how they affect both incarcerated populations and the correctional staff that work there, the Urban Institute launched the Prison Research and Innovation Initiative in 2019. This is a five-year project and we're very grateful for the support of the Arnold Ventures in helping us to one, work to identify how to better leverage research to spur innovation and how to make prisons more humane, safe, and rehabilitative environments. We're drawing upon data from interviews, surveys, administrative records, and existing policies, and we're using the best evidence that's possible to identify, implement, and evaluate reforms. This is not something that we're doing all alone. In fact, it involves a large network, including leadership, insight, and work of many partners like um, five departments of corrections, seven research universities, a state government agency, and we are lucky to have an advisory board of 15 thought leaders in the field. Each of the partners involved in this process are attacking the problem from different possible perspectives. So we have corrections leaders, researchers, advocates, nonprofit leaders, and elected officials. And we're gonna hear from many of those different perspectives today. We also firmly believe that those who are closest to the problem may also be closest to its solution. And towards that end, we've worked with all of our partners to form councils of incarcerated people and corrections officers to assist at every stage of the process. That's not just consulting at the end, but actually from the very conception of the project to designing the research, helping to understand um, and draw insight from findings and through the final implementation of reforms that may come from the work. So today you're gonna to hear about how these efforts fit into a broader prison reform picture nationwide. We're gonna see research conducted also from our five partner states, which are Colorado, Delaware, Iowa, Missouri, and Vermont. And we're also gonna see research from Urban Zone Prison Research and Innovation Initiative. We're gonna talk about what these results mean and how we can use them to create impactful reform. 
So before we start, I want to just offer my thanks to the team here at Urban that has been behind much of this work, and it's a lot of people, and I can't mention them all, but let me acknowledge uh, the Justice Policy Center's Vice President, Preeti Shahan, and the PRII research team. Um, that includes uh, its director, David Pitts, Will Engelhart, Alice Galley, Jesse Janetta, and Evelyn McCoy, along with many others who helped to make the program and today's work possible. I also want to say a big thank you to all of our speakers for participating in the conversation and you in the audience for being engaged and caring about this work. And finally, um, a big thanks to Arnold Ventures. Not only are they supporting this project, but our friend Jeremy Travis helped to spark the idea and our AV colleagues have been good thought partners as well. None more so than our next speaker, our uh, dear friend and uh, inspiration, Jocelyn Fontaine, the Vice President of Criminal Justice Research at Arnold Ventures, and I must say with pride, Urban Institute alum. Jocelyn, thank you for being here and take it away. Thank you so much, Sarah. I'm proud to be an Urban Institute alum. Uh, and I'm really pleased uh, to have this opportunity to work, welcome folks to this uh, virtual meeting space. Uh, sad that we can't be together, but hopefully soon uh, on behalf of the Arnold Ventures uh, criminal justice team. And I'm really eager to hear uh, the discussion this afternoon. I'm so glad that I can participate. Um, I also want to uh, echo the thanks uh, that Sarah uh, did uh, to the uh, Urban Institute project team. There's so many people that are participating in this work um, and under the leadership and, and direction of David Pitts and Priti Shohan uh, for their work on this initiative for the past nearly three years uh, and Urban Institute's commitment to pushing this work forward, um, the bulk under the exceptionally challenging circumstances of uh, brought on by the pandemic. Um, also thankful for the thoughtful planning for this conversation this afternoon, uh, including really important practitioner, advocate, and researcher voices uh, whose combined efforts and thought partnership and skills are so necessary to identifying and advancing evidence-informed and transformational prison reform. I'm glad we can take the time to reflect on this project, its progress and findings to date, uh, how it relates to broader efforts on prison reform, as well as the challenges, and walk away um, identifying some opportunities for continued momentum uh, on prison reform and pushing this work uh, forward in the sites that are part of this initiative and more broadly. Uh, as Sarah mentioned, I'm the Vice President of Criminal Justice Research at Arnold Ventures, and in my role, I have the privilege of working closely with our Executive Vice President, Jeremy Travis, our board, and my wonderful colleagues across the criminal justice team, many of whom are logged into this meeting and are supporting this work, um, to partner with and to support experts and thought partners like the Urban Institute and other research uh, and academic organizations um, to identify and develop research investments that have significant potential to inform justice reform, policy change, and community safety, and to advance the values of fairness, effectiveness, and racial justice. I wanted to use some of my time to lift up why we made this investment in the Urban Institute three years ago and why we continue to support this project and its partners with real enthusiasm and to learn alongside the project team. Uh, so this project is a cornerstone investment in our work on prisons, and it's part of a broader body of work on corrections reform that's being led by my brilliant colleague, uh, Julie James, Vice President of Criminal Justice, uh, who is also joining us. And broadly speaking, um, some of this Sarah talked about, um, we are in this space since prisons are largely inaccessible and unaccountable to the public. Uh, conditions can be inhumane, unsafe, and ineffective at reducing recidivism. And too often they do not offer the opportunities and the incentives for people to change their behavior and to come home safely. Our prison strategy and our investments in research, policy advocacy, strategic litigation, and strategic communication are aligned with the Arnold Ventures mission to maximize opportunity and minimize injustice. And specifically, our prison's portfolio has four main goals, uh, many of which this project is tackling. One, we aim to increase the transparency, accessibility, and accountability of prisons. Uh, two, we hope to improve conditions of confinement and the well-being of people who are in prisons. This includes those who are incarcerated, as well as those who work in prisons. We're focusing on improving preparation for successful reentry as our third goal. And our last goal for this work is to safely reduce incarceration, primarily through the, back, the use of back-end release levers. 
the investment with the Urban Institute and what we're learning from the participating five sites and the local researcher practitioner partnerships that are working on this is aligned with several of the goals that I mentioned. And we're keenly interested in this broader project's theory of change, with, which is how we can use research and evidence to drive change in prison reform and the criminal justice uh, field more broadly, right? So how can we think about uh, research uh, to drive, to inform and promote transformation in prison policy and practice? How can research drive change and transformation within institutions in partnership with correctional leaders uh, through the use of traditional and participatory research methods that center the experiences and expertise of those closest to the issues that we're trying to elevate and to change and through the rigorous assessment and evaluation of the prison climate, uh, culture and context. And so building on the momentum and the partnerships and the learnings from this investment and the conversation that we'll have today and will continue to, we're particularly interested in research that can inform whether and how innovations to prison conditions and environments can lead to better outcomes for individuals, systems, and communities, and how these can, uh, innovations can be reliably scaled. We're also keenly interested in research that examines whether and how uh, prison uh, conditions and environments uh, can support desistance and behavior change, how that can be supported by prison policy and practice to inform the role of correctional sentencing and parole policy. And last but certainly not least, we're also keenly interested in research that examines the impact of policies that expand release opportunities and reduce time served to continue to build the evidence base on the potential for safe reductions in incarceration. With that, I just want to say I'm really, really eager, again, on behalf of my colleagues uh, to hear this conversation, uh, to uh, follow what um, to follow what comes of this conversation and continue to support this work. And we are so incredibly grateful to have the partners convened here virtually who are committed to advancing prison reform to improve the lives of people and communities. And with that, I'll turn it over to Preeti Shohan, the Vice President of Justice Policy at the Urban Institute. Thank you. Thank you, Jocelyn. And um, I just want to start by um, thanking Arnold Ventures, uh, Jocelyn and Jeremy Travis for supporting our work. And I want to welcome everyone here in attendance on behalf of our Dynamite team at the Justice Policy Center at the Urban Institute. The Justice Policy Center engages in research, training, and technical assistance in the criminal legal system. And as a center, we seek to inform solutions to crime and safety challenges in the interest of promoting effectiveness in the criminal legal system, address the harms of victimization and legal system involvement, and reduce racial and other inequities. We recognize the direct connection that links slavery to current, mass, current day mass incarceration and work to reduce the disparities that exist as a result, and this project being one of many that does that work. We do this by conducting objective, rigorous, and interdisciplinary research to produce data-driven recommendations that centers the voices, experiences, and perspectives of people, practitioners, and communities most affected by crime and the legal system. The Prison Research and Innovation Initiative, also known as PRE, is an excellent example of JPC's values and approaches because it works to address and reduce the harms of criminal legal system involvement, both for those who are incarcerated there and those who work within it. PRE also promotes dignity and well-being for incarcerated people by introducing reforms that reduce the harms caused by carceral environments. It improves well-being for correctional staff by understanding staff health needs and working to implement reforms that will alleviate mental health challenges and improve overall well-being. And it does this with a network of local research partners um, to use objective, rigorous, interpersonal, interdisciplinary uh, research methods. And our partners include um, researchers trained in a variety of fields, including criminology, sociology, epidemiology, statistics, and social work. And the data will be used to inform solutions by working with local correctional partners to administer surveys, collect interviews, and administrative data on correctional practices to identify areas for innovation and reform. And 
As both Sarah and Jocelyn mentioned, a unique and really important feature of PRE is that it centers the voices of those most affected by the system using community engaged methods at all phases of data collection and policy implementation. Councils of incarcerated people, as well as correctional officers have weighed in on every aspect of study design, implementation, analysis, and forthcoming recommendations. So today, you will hear from individuals who have been incarcerated, where they feel pr prison conditions need particular attention and what they would prioritize for reform. You will listen to correctional officers and leaders discuss the organizational and management issues they encounter in their work. And you will learn about the research currently underway in PRE, including a climate survey of incarcerated people and correctional staff um, that was completed in 2021. And of course, you will also hear from thought leaders across the criminal legal field, get their insights about reform and how to achieve it. The pre-team David Pitt, led by David Pitts um, and others that Jocelyn mentioned, as well as Sarah, have worked hard to put together today's event. And we are really excited to have you attend here. And with that, I would like to now introduce Amy Fedick, Executive Director of the Sentencing Project and, and pre-advisory board member who will introduce today's keynote speaker. Thank you so much, Pri, and I am so honored to be able to introduce Vivian Nixon, our keynote speaker today. I, I first heard about uh, Vivian uh, because of her amazing work at the College and Community Fellowship, CCF. Now, this is an organization in New York that supports justice-involved women and ensures that they have access to higher education. It is an amazing exemplar of the transformative power of education, of direct organizing and of directly impacted leadership. Vivian herself started as a student with CCF when she was released from prison and she rose to become its executive director, a transformative leadership. While she was doing all of this, Vivian became an ordained minister in the African Methodist Episcopal Church. And she was awarded many, many awards along the way. She received the John Jay Medal for Justice and also served fellowships with the Aspen Institute, the Open Society Foundation, PEN America. Now, if you talk to Vivian, she will tell you that um, all of these honors are really humbling recognitions and opportunities to serve, which says so much about her because my first reaction, of course, is these are overwhelming examples of just how amazing and transformative her leadership is. And frankly, the fact that she's badass. If you can say that about an ordained minister, I don't know, but I just felt that it needed to be said. Now, Vivian says she is retired from nonprofit service, but she currently is actually a writer in residence at Columbia Justice Labs Square One Project, where she is helping to sustain and lead a conversation about the root causes of inequity in, in America's justice system, as well as how we work towards eradicating systems of punishment and focus on creating equity across systems for well being. Now, Reverend Nixon's talk today is going to focus on these important ideas and introduce us to the possibilities that they bring. Uh, I am so excited to hear her thoughts on this topic and to join in the conversation with her as well as the audience. So please do remember that Q&A button, um, put your questions in there. There is going to be time for audience questions and conversation. But now I want to introduce and welcome Reverend Vivian Nexon to this gathering. Let's get this important conversation started. Thank you. Thank you so much. Amy, for that very humbling introduction. I am so pleased to have been invited here to the Urban Institute. My knowledge of the Urban Institute goes way back. It was one of the first organizations that in partnership with John Jay um, did a round table on the idea of education for the population of incarcerated people when I began to do this work um, quite a few years ago. So it is an honor to be with all of you. Uh, my sincere thanks uh, for the invitation um, to uh, Sarah Wartell, the president, to Jocelyn, who we've already heard from, uh, to Preeti from the Justice Policy Center. And thank you also uh, to the Arnold Foundation for funding this. Um, 
Jeremy Travis is a partner and indeed founder of the Square One concept. And I'm so pleased to be writer in residence there now. Thank you, David, for inviting me and to Alice for all the help along the way. Everyone there at the Urban Institute Prison Research and Innovation Initiative, thank you. I'm gonna to talk today, um, not, I don't have the hard job that the rest of the speakers will have today, which is to break down all the complications and details of uh, research and, and formulas for, for how, to, how to get the data right. Uh, but I'm gonna to talk to you of, about how that research um, impacts lives in a way that puts them on paths to success. Uh, it really does trickle down when we get the messaging right, when we tell the correct stories, uh, and when we give people a more complex view of our justice system and how it influences life for every day, uh, people living in our society on the ground. Uh, I had uh, submitted a title for this talk. I don't know that it's, it's the best title for the talk, but we'll go with it for today educational and vocational aspirations, parallel pathways to individual and community well-being. And that title resonates with me because that's what my experience has been, that the educational pathways that I've chosen, the vocational pathways that I've chosen through the aspirations in my own life have been the pathway to my well-being. And I think it can be the pathway to the well being for others. Equality is often expressed in the legal and political rhetoric of American democracy. We talk about equality all the time equal justice under the law, equal pay for equal work, equal access to education and opportunity. So, why is there such disparate impact on some communities when laws and policies become practice? Why are those unintended consequences? Concerns about fairness, maybe? Scarcity, fear? Concepts that all is equal and that what one gets out of life is based on a system of meritocracy may be an underlying problem in the American narrative. The idea that other people will get a boost an advantage, a head start, often translates into why should people who do not do the right thing have access and opportunity equal to mine? But who among us always does the right thing? Is the right thing objective or subjective? Does everyone who doesn't do the right thing always get punished? Are all the things that we would consider bad disallowed by the law? Perhaps our need to decide who deserves or does not deserve the benefits of living in our society is not based on actual behaviors, but based on perception, perception of who others are and fears of losing our own secure place in the social structure. Being a member of society is a partnership. It asks that each of us contribute to the well-being of others. It requires something that cannot be enforced, empathy. Millions of people execute the rules that are levers. They choose to approach their work with empathy, as many do, or without it. Voters, government workers, doctors, nurses, teachers, administrators, employers, Family members all have the power to make decisions that impact the lives of others. It's most obvious, of course, when it comes to children. But as everyone in this Zoom room knows, there are other vulnerable populations. Again, I suggest that one thing that deters empathy is fear of losing status, fear that there are not enough resources to go around. Another is the assumed low expectations about people based on false information, stereotypes, misunderstood data, and resources. 
Have you ever wondered why we pay so little attention to the things that truly drive people toward their aspirations? Personality and actual behavioral health disorders aside, what are the things that push people toward fulfilling lives within the ever-changing boundaries of social parameters? Access to elements of the good life is affected by many socio socioeconomic factors, gender, economic status, ethnicity, among many others. But in rooms like this, we do these days acknowledge structural inequities that are based on many things, but in America, based on a history of discrimination based on race, particularly with indigenous populations, Black Americans and immigrant populations from certain parts of the world. We've been through the racial analysis of the 1994 crime bill and we've done a lot to try to correct the errors and the harm that that piece of legislation caused. We've worked hard in, at the local level, the state level and the federal level to make our policies more fair and more just. And that work is continuing. Many of you in this room have been leaders in that work. And for that, we are all grateful. To me, an equitable society is one that sees and values and vigorously includes everyone in its promise. Are we on the way there? Is the question you all are having a conversation about today. Not only are we on our way there, but how do we leverage the power of research to make sure that we get there? One of the things I remember vividly is when the Second Chance Initiative was first proposed uh, by President uh, Bush in 2004. The announcement was very specific. Research had proven that America could no longer sustain mass incarceration, incarcerating people at levels so high that it was actually causing uh, tipping points in communities where they were more harmed, more dangerous, less safe, and less prone to provide a state of well-being for residents than before mass incarceration. We can thank Todd Clear, Clear for that work. President Bush said, America is the land of second chances. And when the gates of the prison open, the path ahead should lead to a better life. What stunned me about that announcement was the specificity of a, a suggestion that we would solve our problems by job training, transitional housing, helping newly released people get mentoring, and incorporating faith-based faith groups as partners. And all of that was true, but starkly missing in my view was access to education, which I find to be one of those critical pathways. In addition to job training, uh, pathways to real careers that normally involve some type of education are necessary. And the research had already proven that time and time again at the time the Second Chance Initiative was announced. Lo and behold, through lots of hard work and advocacy, again, of many of the people in this Zoom room, we have come to realize that transitional jobs, transitional opportunity, transitional housing, transitional care is not enough. We need pathways to real citizenship and well being. And in order to do that, we have passed ban the box legislation in many states. We have the, at the federal level guidance for employers to look carefully at giving people opportunities that lead to real career pathways. And we have reinstated the opportunity to receive federal grant funding to indigent incarcerated students to go to college. Wow, that is quite a bit toward creating those pathways of opportunity. 
academic counseling, college prep, all the things that people need to get on that right path. That was the work I did at college and community fellowship. And again, research at every level, local, state, federal, proves that education increases a person's chances of success far more than many other interventions. We learned in this time period that employers look at people with criminal records and often make assumptions about who has a criminal record and who doesn't based on factors not rooted in fact, but rooted in prejudice and longstanding racial bias. We have research that proves that. And so now it is time for us to continue the thrust toward minimizing the impact that that discrimination has by reckoning with the truth of who we are as a country and stating this is not who we want to be and here are the things we're going to do to change that. Self-efficacy comes from a lot of places, but no one does anything on their own. No one who succeeds, succeeds by themselves or succeeds with an entire society crushing down um, with the weight of history that categorizes whole classes of people as less than. It is our responsibility to lift that veil, to begin to share power in the policies, practices, and programs that are implemented, to tell the truth about who we are as a country, and to begin to have that conversation without fear, without fear that having that conversation takes something away from one group and gives it to another, to have that conversation without fear that there aren't enough resources to go around, to have that conversation without fear that the uh, spikes that we see occasionally in crime um, are rooted in a person's ethnicity or their economic status or any other mutable factor. Uh, one example for the researchers in the room is the conversation we've been having about spikes in crime now around our country. It's being blamed on some of the reforms that have um, relieved a lot of people of heavy burdens. For instance, bail reform having people locked up before they even convicted of anything, putting them at risk of losing relationships, losing jobs, losing housing. But crime is spiking everywhere where there is bail reform and where there is no bail reform. So there has been no research to prove that bail reform is at the root of that problem. Researchers are needed because researchers can explain to those who report the news, who report the data, how the data looks on the ground. Uh, this is going to be a great conversation today. It's a needed conversation. It's going to help in many ways to disconnect the ideas that crime is inherently uh, connected to a person's identity. There are so many other factors in our society that impact crime. If we and when we give people real opportunities to find those pathways to employment and careers, to find those pathways to meaningful education that, that resonates with their own vision for their lives, that resonates with their own aspirations, people will succeed. And there's research from the University of Connecticut that says that since this conversation is about research. Every organization working with this population, whether working on the inside or working upon release, can have an impact on the lives of the people they are working with. But it matters what we think about the people we work with. It matters what we believe they are capable of. We stand in two places right now in our society. It has been a rough couple of years, a pandemic, way too many incidents of racial bias that have rocked the nation. We're on the precipice of regression. 
and we've made so much progress. We're also on the brink of innovation. And that's what you're here to discuss today. Now it's time to stop tiptoeing around the foundations of injustice, go back to the drawing board and embrace a sustained conversation about repairing past harms. Personal narratives of success are not in short supply. I'm a witness. Let's respond with empathy that is so fierce that it forces us to see all people, value all people, and vigorously include all people in the promise of America. We're not calculating all the cost when we talk about dollar for dollar, how much it costs to incarcerate someone and how much it saves us to not incarcerate someone. There are those invisible costs. There are families around the country who know what those costs are. Incarceration has never been what makes us safe. No one in this room thinks of safety as incarceration, but we consistently ignore facts and truth. What makes us safe? Opportunity. What makes us safe? A society in which each of us can pursue our aspirations without discrimination. What makes us safe? Passing ban the box law so that employers can't discriminate. What makes us safe? Restoring educational opportunity to incarcerated students. What makes us safe? Investing in housing for the unhoused. Investing in home ownership for low-income families. Investing in healthcare for those who need access to it. Investing in mental health treatment for those who have behavioral and mental health challenges. And believing that all those people are worth the investment. That's what creates well-being. So let's believe this about the people we serve in the criminal justice system of our society. Let's believe that they can find pathways to success using their own values and aspirations. Let's believe they can be leaders if we focus on helping them lead. Let's believe they can be educated if we invest in their education. Let's believe that they can be innovators if we invest in career pathways that allow them to innovate. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vivian. I am so excited to start this conversation with you. Your words, I, I you know, inspiring. And this is a day where we need some inspiration. Uh, and I want to remind the audience members, put your Q&A the, in the Q&A box, and I will read those questions uh, and share them with Vivian and start this conversation. Um, you know, one, one question that folks have, Vivian, is you mentioned during your talk that um, Pell Grants are now going to be available um, in, in, to incarcerated students who are indigent. Um, this, you know, from my own perspective, this is one of the most exciting things that has happened. Um, it's a true, a true testament to a lot of advocacy and a lot of passion that made that happen. Um, it's a wonderful opportunity. How should community members, political leaders, and corrections leaders and institutions be embracing this opportunity to ensure that justice involved students have access to Pell Grants, to higher education, to better pathways. Well, I, I, um, I hope that corrections uh, professionals, and, and this certainly was the case when Pell Grants were previously available prior to 1994, recognize that not only is it an opportunity for incarcerated people to get kind of a head start on re-entering the community where they will enter the community with critical thinking skills, with, with the ability to um, you know, move with society as technology becomes more complicated and education is more necessary to earn a living, 
but it also provided, uh, according to many corrections professionals, um, assistance with running facilities. It was uh, during the years when Pell was available, the proliferate proliferation of education programs inside of over 350 facilities helped to organize um, incarcerated people around positive activity, uh, activity that was not about territory or um, defending oneself and in, in, in feeling vulnerable in a situation where people just had way too much time on their hands uh, and were incarcerated for way too long for far too many things. Uh, the education programs were some of the were the programs that seemed to stabilize institutions and build leadership within those institutions. And then uh, on the outside, I think it's up to those of us who work in the reentry space or who have worked in the reentry space to embrace folks who have the higher levels of education as potential leaders. Um, to uh, to not just discount that leadership as well, okay, you made it out, you're going to succeed, you're gonna have a job, you're gonna, you're, you're going to be one of the ones that doesn't become a statistic, but join us as we try to create a more fair and just system. Uh, become part of the solution and not part of the problem. So I, I think we can all work together to create that. I hope so. Uh, we really have to, don't we? <laughs> Um, another question that folks have is sort of building on this. Do you have some ideas about how conditions, programs, approaches within prisons and jails can be more gender responsive so that they are enabling more education, but also those wellness pathways that you spoke about in your talk? You know, a lot of... Um... There's a lot of controversy around whether retraining um, is what is needed. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, there certainly is a place for training. Uh, I don't know how responsive uh, curricula in institutions that train corrections professionals are to gender issues. Uh, but I also understand why advocates are suspect that training is at the root of the problem. I think the conversation begins with us acknowledging everyone's humanity, acknowledging everyone's human dignity. And if we and that includes people who work in corrections facilities, people who are incarcerated in those facilities and their families. Mm -hmm. um, it needn't be adversarial. We are a long way from a world without prisons. And I know that there are hundreds of thousands of people who dream of that world, but we're not there. We're a long way from being there. So right now, today, how do we acknowledge human dignity? Brian Stevenson talks a lot about proximity, but proximity doesn't happen when one person is behind bars and in a cage and the other person isn't. If we can create spaces that aren't about training, but are about conversations, about listening to each other, about developing real relationships and acknowledging human dignity, I really think we can um, make working in a system of justice about justice and not about punishment. Rethink entirely what the, what the system is for. As long as we think it's for punishment, there's not that opportunity to be gender responsive or responsive to any other aspect of human dignity. That, that is such a great point. And, and it builds on some of the questions that the audience is, is asking. We've got a lot of correctional officers, leaders in this audience, sort of thinking through, well, how do we shift that punishment paradigm that is so dominant in American corrections and in the, the way that institutions are run and conceived, uh, both by the people who work there and the people who live there? Um, what can we do to support correctional officers, correctional leaders in moving away from that punishment paradigm into a, a culture that supports wellness and human dignity for everyone involved. Do you have some first baby steps that, that folks can yeah. take? 
<laughs> well, you know, we have, just like we have to invest in the well being of marginalized communities who have been impacted by economic disparity and racial disparity, we need to invest in the well being of people who work in corrections and their families and communities. You know, in so many places across this country, corrections officers it is not the best job in the world. Let's just leave it there. Um, you know, invest in their opportunity for education so that they can grow and develop. Um, it is not, a, it's not a one-sided deal. Let's, let's make it two-sided because if you're doing better, I'm doing better and let all boats rise. Absolutely. Living conditions uh, are working conditions in corrections and I, I try to always remember that. That's right. Absolutely. You know, you spoke during your address about this, the, this issue that we see in a lot of different aspects of American life. And that is the sense that if, if one group gets something, one group doesn't get something. It's sort of this resource guarding. Uh, we definitely saw that in the, the Pell debates. And that's why it took like how many years and decades of effort uh, because the idea from the American constituency was, well, why should we allow prisoners to get free education? Um, I don't get that, so why should they? Um, and we see that in other aspects of, uh, from medical care to job training to even being treated with human dignity. Um, that's, there's a strain of that in America and maybe in human beings. How, how can we push back against that? How can we build empathy? Uh, while acknowledging the pain that some people experience, even while oftentimes blaming the wrong source for that pain. That, you know, that for me is a, is a question of where we get our values from and whether or not we can reckon our values with our behavior. Uh, and so it's a question that, you know, when I think about social work training, when I think about theological training, it is, it is a question of the soul. Um, and empathy always starts in, in those worlds, both in social work and in theology. Empathy starts in the mirror. Mm -hmm. It starts when we can look at ourselves and recognize our own flaws and shortcomings and therefore be a little bit more empathetic and understanding uh, regarding the shortcomings and failures of other people. Uh, recognize that when we fall short, we want second chances that we want opportunity and that sometimes life is hard for us and we need a helping hand. It always starts with a look in the mirror. Um, and America is one of the most, if not the most religious country in the world. Uh, and there is not one religion that I have studied that has as its, its grounding fear, punishment and um, dismissal of the other person's needs. All of the religions I've studied are rooted in care for the other person, in treating your neighbor like you want to be treated. So we just have to reemphasize, these are the values we profess. Let's have our behavior match our values. Amen to that. There is another audience question that is kind of related to this. And, and... <sighs> They mentioned that, look, the criminal justice system is an economic system. There are organizations that benefit economically from high levels of incarceration. Uh, they don't necessarily have an interest in decarceration. Um, is there a way that we can start convincing these systems, these organizations that uh, you know, their short-term gains are actually undermining long-term prosperity? Um, that there are broader economic benefits for returning citizens to, to come home and to thrive in the community. Do you have thoughts on how we do that? I do. Well, I, I wish I had answers, but I do have thoughts. <laughs> uh, very few answers because, I, you know, capitalism is a very complex system. And uh, while, you know, that is, that is the system we are working under, a workforce is needed in order to make capitalism work. We're finding though, and if, if you even notice what happened post pandemic with the workforce largely just saying, you know, you know, we give up, we, we want a different way of life. Um, we're finding that when you don't take care of people 
they eventually wear out. Like human beings are human beings and you can't literally work people to death. Uh, so I think in this system, we need to, to understand that um, there need to be levers of control, that it can't be a system run amok. Uh, if this is the system we're going to live under, there need to be regulations and limits and the sky is not the limit uh, because there is enough to go around. It's kind of the same conversation we're having about climate change, mm -hmm. where uh, you know we bear a large share of the burden, but don't want a large share of the responsibility. I, I, we have to start having that open conversation about the nature of capitalism and what are the levers we can put in place to put some type of uh, breaks on the unlimited, unregulated system of monetary exchange and commerce that we have. It, it's a, it is a tall order, isn't it? <laughs> it is. uh, you know, it's so interesting that you bring up climate change um, and wellness and how, how can, you know, I mean, I'm a criminal justice reform advocate criminal legal reform advocate, many of the people on, on this presentation and this, this conversation are, how can we be thinking more systemically about wellness? I mean, we're talking about wellness in these institutions, wellness in the community. And then there's this overlay of global warming where every community is at risk seemingly, but none of us kind of really want to admit it or, or as you point out, take the measures necessary to, to mitigate the impacts. Um, are there ways that, that criminal legal reform advocates, whether or not we wanna build better prisons or abolish them, can start working more hand in glove towards a broader view of what community wellness actually means? Yeah, I, I think uh, the place to start is at home. If I believe if corrections officials, personnel at every level looked at and understood the data about their own wellness, Mm -hmm. How many people working in corrections um, compared to the general population suffer from you know, the most common disease, ki killing diseases, heart disease, cancer, um, mental illness? How, what is the ratio of correction officers who commit suicide as compared to the general public? Uh, my understanding is that it's much higher. These, you know, looking at the wellness of your own community, and it is a community, um, uh, Bruce Western, who is, is, is um, co-leader of the Justice Lab, talks really eloquently about the idea that identity is at the core of what we, what we do, uh, how we impact the world with our work, with our labor. That if you're a police officer, if you're a corrections person, if you're a social worker, that's part of your identity. So when we, when we just outright put a blanket, you know, um, statement out about all police officers or all correction officers, we're attacking people's identity and that hurts. Mm -hmm. But that community can look at its own circle and see the, the level of well being that they could have if we approach things a little differently. And, you know, maybe it sounds like a selfish way to approach change, but if that's where we have to start, it's a good enough start for me. <laughs> We just have to start. Yeah, <laughs> Let's just start. Um, there are some very the particular questions that folks had, and I think that would be really helpful for the audience to hear uh, about wellness measures, specifically what can prison libraries do or, or prison art programs? How can they be employed or grown or expanded to really focus on wellness, both for people who are living in jails and prisons, but also people who are working there? Absolutely. And one of the things that I am a proponent of is that all of these opportunities should be available to anybody who has to spend their days in a prison, including the people who work there. So, you know, if you're going to give opportunity, make sure that everybody has access. I'm big on access. Uh, there's so much going on now in the space of arts and literature. Uh, there's a wonderful uh, national program funded by Mellon called Freedom Reads that is trying to put capsules with a, um, a set of literature in thousands of prisons that will open people's minds, lead to critical thinking and understanding of our shared history 
our shared humanity, and begin to start a conversation even behind the walls of our institutions about what it takes to free us as a people, what it takes to make our communities better. I think that's a good thing. There are those who don't support investing in the improvement of institutions because they don't think the institutions should exist. My concern is for the living bodies that are in those institutions right now. And um, I think putting books in those institutions, giving people opportunities to express themselves through the arts, to find what it is that kind of makes them ticks, that gives them an aspiration for a better future, I'm all for it. And I think we should invest more in it. We absolutely should. And what do you think, Vivian, about you are working on equity and specifically racial equity in the justice system, trying to build equity across those systems. How can we start conversations in prisons and jails about racial equity? Uh, I mean, from many, from my, my own perspective and the perspective of many of the people that I work with, of course, we think that racism informs every aspect of the way our justice system operates. It is in the very structure and DNA of our current system. Um, how do we start to untangle that? But how do we bring that conversation inside the walls when we know that so often, even uh, you know, the merest min mention of critical race theory, which no one understands actually what that is, that is so explosively divisive. How do we start that conversation where it really needs to be, which is in, in these institutions where harm is perpetuated by structural racism? Again, I think we need to have a sustained conversation in this country about our racial history. It is so misunderstood. And there, um, we sometimes we talk as if we're so far removed from it that it's ancient history. When, you know, 1964, I was alive. So it can't be that ancient, right? Right. When the Civil Rights Act was passed on the heels of uh, Prince Edward County in Virginia, rather than integrate their school system, shut down public schools for five years. And during that time, they put a system in place so that white children could get educated, but they put no system in place for black children. Do you not think that the people and the children of Prince Edward County suffered some severe damage in those five years and that their children also inherited that damage and three generations after still haven't caught up? So we have to we have to not be afraid to talk about race and the damage racial discrimination has done in this country, not as a blame game. I mean, it, makes, it is not useful to talk about it in a way that we are blaming you and um, you need to fix this. We're, we're talking about it that in order for our society to be healthy, in order for all of us to have opportunity and well being, we have to have this conversation. And once we reckon, once we see what the, where the imbalances are and measure those imbalances, we can then figure out, well, how do we repair those imbalances? What does repair look like? We have to do it together. We can't do it as long as we're opposing forces because opposing forces move farther and farther apart like a magnet. It's only when we start coming together that we're gonna be able to solve this problem. Oh, Vivian, this has been a, an amazing and inspiring conversation. And I so wish we could continue it for the rest of the day because we have opened up so many things uh, and there is so much great work to do and your inspiring vision and voice is gonna help us do it. Um, so thank you so much for joining you, us and the audience today. And I'm looking forward to more. Um, it was my pleasure. I really am honored to have been invited. Thank you. So now, uh, I'm going to hand it over to David Pitts, who is the Senior Research Fellow at the Urban Institute, and he is leading up the Prison Research and Innovation Initiative. Thank you so much, David, and thank you so much, everyone. Um, thank you so much, um, both of you. I appreciate it very, very much. Um, as uh, Amy said, I'm David Pitts. I'm a Senior Research Fellow at Urban, and I direct the Prison Research and Innovation Initiative. And it's my pleasure to join my colleagues in welcoming all of you here this afternoon. Um, but before I get started, I want to acknowledge that it's a tough spot to follow Amy Fettig and Vivian Nixon. Uh, but I want to thank Reverend Nixon 
for such an ins uh, inspiring, I think, and insightful keynote um, for your time today, share your thoughts with us. But I think more importantly, the decades of work that you put into this area. I know that, that all of us here are very grateful to you and for what you do and have done. I also want to thank all of you for joining us. Um, in reviewing the registration list, we have a really good variety of folks with us today. We have researchers, corrections leaders, nonprofit service providers, advocates, and students. And you all bring these different, but I think crucial perspectives um, to the issues that we're facing. And so we at Urban, I know, greatly appreciate your time, your energy, and your work in what I think we all know to be a very complicated area of public policy. So I would like to spend the next 15 minutes or so talking with you about the initiative that brings us together today. Um, again, the Prison Research and Innovation Initiative, or what we call PRE for short. And our focus on PRE is pretty clear and straightforward. PRE is a pro project about prisons, specifically state-run prisons. And we take this approach um, for three specific sets of reasons that are interrelated and that Sarah touched on a little bit in her initial welcoming remarks. First, as Sarah said, state prisons are wide-reaching institutions. We know that they house over a million people. They employ hundreds of thousands of staff. And according to the National Conference of State Legislatures, corrections expenditures in 2019 totaled some $45 billion. 90% of which went to incarceration. Secondly, despite their size and influence, they are among the least understood and studied institutions in the policy world. A 2014 National Academy of Sciences report on incarceration in the United States indicated that existing data don't even provide the most basic information about the conditions of confinement faced by those who are incarcerated. There is a research base on conditions. It is a developing research base and efforts have been undertaken to understand empirically uh, some of the issues using data collected in individual states and in individual facilities or maybe a state or two. But data across many states, much less national data are very rare. And we believe that this limits our ability to understand conditions and to identify where the changes need to be made. And finally, even though prisons themselves are black boxes, we do know that whatever happens within them, they have substantially negative consequences for staff and incarcerated people. We know that those who are incarcerated are disproportionately likely to have chronic health problems, including things like diabetes, high blood pressure, and HIV, as well as substance abuse and mental health problems. From the perspective of correctional officers, two studies uh, have found that COs have uh, an average life expectancy of 59 years old full 16 years below the national average. So to recap, prisons are number one, huge arms of state bureaucracy that directly impact hundreds of thousands of people. Two, they're opaque institutions with very little transparency or oversight. And three, they tend to have some pretty negative consequences for those who experience them. And so how is PRE going to work to address these issues? Uh, we start with four fundamental normative values that form the basis for our work in this area. We believe that prisons should be transparent institutions, not only because of their size and reach, but also because of the nature of their work. We believe that prisons have an obligation to provide a humane living environment for those who are incarcerated and a humane working environment for those who work within them. We believe that even though prisons have historically been inertial institutions, that they have the capacity to engage in transformational thinking and policy change. We believe that partnering with reform-minded corrections leaders will produce, and indeed we know has produced, meaningful, impactful change. And finally, uh, as all of our welcoming uh, speakers said earlier, research about those who are incarcerated, as well as research about correctional staff, should involve those populations at every step of the process. We strongly believe that there should be no research about us without us, and that we have an ethical responsibility to engage those with lived experience in our work. So how do we put these values into practice? The core component of our pre-project is the Prison Research and Innovation Network, which is a consortium of states that have committed to partnering with us in the pursuit of change. In 2019, at the outset of the project, Urban issued an RFP asking for proposals from states that were interested in joining the network. There were four broad initial requirements. Each lead applicant had to be a State Department of Corrections, 
that state DOC had to have support from key state government leadership to ensure that there was support within the broader state policy environment, that state DOC had to choose as a pilot facility, a public institution, not a private prison, with a capacity of 300 or more, and the state DOC had to engage a research partner from a local university or another government agency. And these states, um, by uh, submitting a bid, agreed to sign on for a five-year commitment that included working with Urban across a variety of research and policy activities that I'll talk more about in a moment. And then after a competitive process, Urban chose to partner with five states. Uh, as Sarah mentioned at the, at the top of the event, the Colorado Department of Corrections with support from the University of Denver, the Delaware Department of Corrections, along with the University of Delaware, the Iowa Department of Corrections with support from the Iowa Department of Human Rights, the Missouri Department of Corrections, along with the University of Missouri, and the Vermont Department of Corrections with support from the University of Vermont. And as you can see, these partners represent a pretty diverse set of states. They are both large and small by population and geography. Uh, we have both unified and non-unified systems. We have four pilot facilities that are designated as men's facilities and one pilot facility designated for women. And so we believe this to be a pretty good cross section of prisons in America, um, at least as far as one can get with a, a sample of only five. And so now that we have this network, what is this network doing specifically to promote transparency, to promote humanity and to promote change? Well, our sites have agreed to do a number of things, uh, but I want to highlight five specific things that states are working on in the initiative. First and foremost, each state has agreed to include correctional staff and incarcerated people throughout project activities. So some of the states have formed committees of representatives who are incarcerated or who are staff to meet on a regular basis. Some states have brought on advisors who weigh in on project activities as needed. And other states have included people who were formerly incarcerated or previously worked in corrections as part of their core project team. Secondly, each state has agreed to hire a full-time employee called a prison research and innovation manager who is embedded within the target facility and serves as a central contact for both staff and incarcerated people. And Dana plunkett Safarek, who is the prison research and innovation manager in Missouri, is gonna talk more about her role in this during our second panel today. Third, in the interest of transparency, each state has agreed to make public a four set of metrics that describe the experiences of those who are incarcerated and correctional staff and to make those available to the public on a quarterly basis. And so per, uh, Urban is currently working uh, with each DOC to identify the metrics that they have the capacity to collect and to determine the method by which those method, uh, metrics will be made public. And so these are ultimately going to vary by jurisdiction, but we anticipate them to include things like disciplinary incidents, transfers to restrictive housing, injuries, sustaining custody, uh, things like that for incarcerated populations, on the staff side, uh, we're looking at things like work-related injuries, hours of overtime, promotions, and uh, staff vacancy rates. And so by reporting this quarterly, we'll be able to see how conditions change in facilities over time. And we believe that this not only promotes transparency, but it also keeps systems accountable for upticks on negative uh, metrics as they occur. Fourth, uh, each state has agreed to administer a climate survey to both incarcerated people and to staff on an annual basis. And so while the metrics that I just talked about, uh, I think are useful tools in understanding prison conditions, I think we would all agree that they're only part of uh, what's going on. And the opinions, the attitudes, and the perceptions of those affected by time in prison are crucial to include in any data collection effort. And so our climate surveys include a core set of questions that appear on all, at, for all five sites, on things like perceptions of safety, contact with family, availability of activities for those who are incarcerated, and for staff, uh, questions about job satisfaction, views on workplace culture, uh, and re uh, interactions with the incarcerated population. In addition to those core sets of questions, each site also asks the battery of additional questions that address a variety of issues that are specific to the given jurisdiction. And so all of those questions were developed in close collaboration with the incarcerated population and with the staff representatives that I mentioned a moment ago. And so in all, we believe this produces data sets that will track prison conditions over time from the perspective of both incarcerated people and staff and drawn from five different states in five different contexts. 
At this point in the project, our states are just now finishing the analysis of data from the first climate survey last year. And some of the findings you're going to hear about on our two panels later today. And so finally, each state has also agreed to develop transformative policy changes that will be pilot tested in each site facility. And we want these policy changes to stem directly from the results of the climate survey and take an evidence-based approach, a research-based approach to reform so that we use the data to inform the change. As with the survey, these policy changes will also be developed in close collaboration with incarcerated people and staff. And as we see what works, uh, we will hopefully be able to expand beyond the pilot facility into other facilities within the same state, and hopefully then into other states altogether. Uh, as we see what doesn't work, uh, it will be important for us, I think, to, to think critically about why it didn't work and to think about how those barriers might be addressed via a restructured policy or a restructured program. And so this is the phase of the project that comes next for us, and we're very excited to see how the states are gonna use information from the climate surveys to identify policy changes that will then be implemented. And so overall, we hope that we can expand our network to include other states after this initial five-year period and bring evidence-driven transformative change processes to be part of the culture of a variety of departments of corrections across the country. And so while this network, and while the, the states that I just described is a core part of our initiative, I wanna mention several other components that PRE has underway. The first of which is that we are working to engage in impactful research about prison conditions. So there is an urban publication authored by former colleagues and uh, former project leadership, Cassandra Rondath and Bethany Young, that lays out a comprehensive research agenda that is structured around important questions facing those interested in prison reform. The agenda covers topics like prison culture, oversight and accountability, office and well-being, and issues affecting vulnerable populations. That document is forthcoming this spring, so you should be on the lookout for that soon. We are also developing a series of topical briefs that explore issues of interest to those working in prison conditions, um, including a brief about restrictive housing that is forthcoming, along with others that are currently available on Urban's website, including a brief about conducting prison research with a racial equity frame, organizational justice in correctional settings, participatory research in prisons, and how we can uh, improve health and healthcare in corrections as well. In addition to that research, we formed an advisory board of thought leaders in the field, including transformative thinkers with experience as advocates, researchers, policymakers, and corrections leaders. And many of those individuals, like Amy Fedig, are with us today as moderators and panelists and continue to provide invaluable guidance both to urban and to our sites in the network. The round table today, is designed to be one in a series that brings together thought leaders that um, then discuss research and policy change in U.S. prisons. Our topics today are pretty broad and comprehensive, but in future roundtables, uh, we might focus on more specific ways and specific areas in which transformation can happen. We essentially want to use this project as a platform through which conversations like those we will have today can be hosted. And finally, we're engaged in an ongoing process evaluation that will identify the different factors that have facilitated or obstructed the rollout of our network. We've conducted a number of interviews with stakeholders in each of our network states, along with an in-depth policy document review. And so we aim for this part of our project to produce research that identifies how states can implement initiatives like this by taking advantage of factors that we know to promote change and then avoid those that we find to be barriers against change. And so to wrap up, I wanna thank you again for joining us today. If you have any questions at all about our project, I hope that you won't hesitate to get in touch with me at dpits at urban.org. And now we are going to take a short 10 minute break and return for our first panel at 2.25 p.m. Eastern time. Thank you. <laughs>